Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to this event with Jordan Ellenberg, discussing his new book, Shape, The Hidden Geometry of Information, Biology, Strategy, Democracy, and Everything Else, in conversation with Kathy O'Neill. This evening's lecture is a part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now far beyond it. Uh, be on the lookout for some of our great science book talks coming up. On Tuesday, June 1st, we will host psychiatrist Veronica O'Keen for her book, A Sense of Self, Memory, the Brain, and Who We Are. And on June 7th, we'll host Andrew Knoll for his latest book, A Brief History of Earth, Four Billion Years in Eight Chapters. To learn more about the series, you can visit the webpage harvard.com slash science or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. We also have a YouTube page where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. Um, and I'm going to be posting links in the Zoom chat for these in just a few minutes. This evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows. This event will also have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you are using, you might need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. I would also like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage during these very strange virtual times. Your support makes this author series possible and ensures the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, indie book selling, and especially for science. Finally, as you have likely experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm gonna do my best to resolve them quickly. Uh, thank you for your patience and your understanding. So now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Award-winning mathematician and author Jordan Ellenberg is professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where his research specializes in arithmetic, algebraic geometry, and number theory. A co-organizer of the Wisconsin Number Theory Seminar and a Discovery Fellow at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, Dr. Ellenberg is also the author of the 2014 book, How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking. His work has been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, Slate, where he's a regular columnist, and more. Joining him in conversation tonight is fellow mathematician, data scientist, and Bloomberg opinion columnist, Kathy O'Neill. In 2017, she founded the consulting firm Orca to audit algorithms for racial, gender, and economic inequality. She's also the author of the best-selling book, Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. And her upcoming book coming out in May, 2022 is The Shame Machine, Who Profits in the New Age of Humiliation. Tonight, they'll be discussing Dr. Ellenberg's latest book, Shape, hailed as unreasonably entertaining by the New York Times. Quote, to Ellenberg, geometry is not a reprieve from life, but a force in it and one that can be used for good, ill, and for pleasures of its own. Dr. O'Neill similarly praises the book writing, shape is a triumph of mathematical exposition, exposing profound truths as well as profound mistakes. Ellenberg's evident affection for both his subject and his reader make us feel like the lucky ones who get to hear him hold forth in an intimate setting about his favorite subject, mathematics. We're honored to host them both for this event tonight. So without further ado, Dr. Ellenberg, the digital podium is yours to begin with a reading from your book. Hi, Kate, thanks so much. And it's so great to be back at Harvard Bookstore, one of my very favorite stores. Uh, even if I can't be there in person to visit Harvard Bookstore and not get to eat a Bartley's burger afterwards is almost physically painful to me, but it is something I will have to endure under the circumstances, but I hope to be back in the near future. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna start just by reading a little bit from the beginning of the book, a few sort of chunks from the from the introduction, and then Kathy and I talk, um, I don't even know about what, we're gonna find out uh, what Kathy wants to talk to me about, and then we will take your questions. So. I'm a mathematician who talks about math in public, and this seems to unlock something in people. They tell me things. They tell me stories I sense they haven't told anyone in a long time, maybe ever. 
stories about math, sometimes sad stories, a math teacher rubbing a kid's ego in the mud for no reason but meanness. Sometimes the story is happier, an experience of abrupt illumination that burst open a child's mind, an experience the grown up wanted to find a path back to, but never quite could. Actually, this one is kind of sad too. Often these stories are about geometry. It seems to stand out in people's high school memories like a weird, loud, out of scale note in a chorus. There are people who hate it, who tell me geometry was the moment math stopped making sense to them. Others tell me it was the only part of math that made sense to them. Geometry is the cilantro of math. Few are neutral. What makes geometry different? Somehow it's primal, built into our bodies. From the second we exit hollering from the room, from the womb, we're reckoning where things are and what they look like. Look, I'm not one of those people who will tell you everything important about our inner lives can be traced back to the needs of a shaggy band of savannah dwelling hunter gatherers, but it's hard to doubt that those folks had to develop knowledge of shapes, the distances and locations, probably before they had the words to talk about them. When South American mystics and their non-South American imitators drink ayahuasca, the sacred hallucinogenic tea, the first thing that happens, okay, the first thing that happens after the uncontrollable vomiting is the perception of pure geometric form, repeating two-dimensional patterns like the lattice work in a classical mosque or full three-dimensional visions of hexahedral cells clustered into pulsating honeycombs. Geometry is still there when the rest of our reasoning mind is stripped away. William Wordsworth, in the long, mostly autobiographical poem, The Prelude, tells a somewhat implausible story about a shipwreck victim hurled ashore on an uninhabited island with nothing in his possession but a copy of Euclid's Elements, the book of geometric axioms and propositions that launched geometry as a formal subject about two and a half millennia ago. Good luck for a shipwreck guy, depressed and hungry though he is, he consoles himself by working his way through Euclid's demonstrations one by one tracing out the diagrams in the sand with the stick. That's just what it was like to be young, sensitive, poetic Wordsworth, writes middle-aged Wordsworth. Or to let the poet speak, mighty is the charm of those abstractions to a mind beset with images and haunted by itself. So then I sort of talk about the surprising fact that this story is actually basically true. He like ripped it off from the memoir of an actual shipwreck victim. Um, I talk a little bit about Wordsworth's bromance with a young William Rowan Hamilton, the creator of Quaternions, but um, I'm going to skip over that for a moment and just kind of come to the conclusion of the introduction right here, which is right here. Wordsworth's take is typical of geometry as viewed from a distance. Admiration, yes, but the way we admire an Olympic gymnast executing flips and contortions that seem impossible for ordinary humans. It's what you get too in the most famous geometry poem of all, Edna St. Vincent Millay's sonnet, Euclid alone has looked on beauty bare. Millay's Euclid is a singular unearthly figure blasted with enlightenment by a shaft of insight on a, here's her quote, holy terrible day. Not like the rest of us who Millay says might, if we're lucky, get to hear beauty's footsteps hurrying off down a faraway hallway. That's not the geometry this book is about. Don't get me wrong, as a mathematician, I get a lot of benefit from geometry's prestige. It feels good when people think the work you do is mysterious, eternal, elevated among the, above the common plane. How was your day? Oh, holy and terrible, the usual. But the harder you push that point of view, the more you incline people to see the study of geometry as an obligation. It acquires the slightly musty smell of something admired because it is good for one, like opera. And that kind of admir admiration isn't enough to sustain the enterprise. There are plenty of new operas, but can you name them? No. You hear the word opera and you think of a mezzo soprano in furs bellowing Puccini, probably in black and white. There's plenty of new geometry too. And like new opera, it's not as well publicized as it could be. Geometry isn't Euclid and it hasn't been for a long time. It's not a cultural relic trailing an odor of the schoolroom, but a living subject moving faster now than it ever has before. In the chapters to come, 
of the new geometry of pandemic spread, of the messy US political process, of professional level checkers, of artificial intelligence, of the English language, of finance, of physics, even of poetry. A lot of geometers secretly dream, like William Roman Ham Hamilton, of being poets. We are living in a wild geometric boomtown, global in scope. Geometry isn't out there beyond space and time. It's right here with us, mixed in with the reasoning of everyday life. Is it beautiful? Yes, but not there. Geometers see beauty with its work clothes on. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. That's like part from the very beginning of the book. And uh, now we're gonna see Kathy and we're just gonna talk to each other about what? What are we gonna talk about? Jordan, it is unreasonable um, how entertaining your book is. I think that the New York Times. Um, That's what people are saying. That's what people yeah, are saying. Exactly. Um, I'm going to start with one of my last questions, if that's okay with you, um, which is why do you think you can get away with talking about literally whatever you want and call it geometry? Because everything actually is geometry. Is that fair? I mean, you are absolutely right uh, that in some sense, if I were to say people, okay, I wrote a book and it's about gerrymandering and neural nets and um, poetry and high level checkers and pandemic spread, people would be like, what is your book about? Um, but the truth is, I wrote about all those things and those were not all things I sort of set out to start writing about. Um, I wrote about those things because as I wrote, the connections between them started to develop. I wrote about the things that sort of naturally spread out from the things I was all I was already writing about. So these kind of geometric ideas that animate the book, um, the idea of the random walk, the idea of what is distance, this kind of fact that we think about in metaphors of distance and closeness in sort of so many different contexts, um, those bind all those subjects together. So I stand by the claim that it actually is a book about one thing. Okay, great. And that was what I was going to say. I was I was going to suggest, even though you're reading, which was entertaining um, as usual, it's about what geometry isn't. It isn't this, you know, side angle side that we learned in tenth grade or whatever. Whenever we learned that, um, it's not Euclid anymore. If you don't mind, just for this hour, we're going to define geometry to be a study of anything that includes the notion of distance. Is that fair? Yeah. And then I'm going to ask you to riff, if you will, on a various topics that come up in your book that I, I find entertaining, if not infuriating, um, that that involve this notion of distance. And and I, if you don't mind, I would like you just to sort of riff on the subject itself, but also just tie it into this concept of distance and, and geometry. OK, so. Basically, from now on, I'm not going to speak. I'm just going to give you one word prompts. Is that is that satisfying to you? OK, the one word prompt now is gerrymandering. I like, I like what you didn't wait for my answer. You were just like, <laughs> is that OK? And now I will continue without waiting. I'm not time. actually asking. It's a, OK. Yeah. Gerrymandering, is that the prompt? That's the prompt. It sucks. Am I supposed to say more than that? I will. Yes, please. I mean, I, 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 I gather this is one of the reasons your book comes out during a pandemic is because of Tell me, tell us why. Well, so, okay. So gerrymandering um, is the process of motivatedly drawing legislative districts in such a way that benefits the political party that you work for. And that has, on the one hand, been going on for a long time. Um, and on the other hand, is sort of a problem of unique magnitude right now for reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it also is something which I think historically, it's gone on for a long time, but it's been seen as something kind of technical and dull and maybe people write about in like political science journals, but it has not sort of like broken out into being a live political issue. And that has all changed. And I think largely in the last 10 years, I think largely because um, of a very successful effort after the 2010 census. So it's after the census that we draw these legislative lines that each state has new official population figures. So the existing districts, whether state legislative districts or, or US congressional districts are no longer of roughly equal population. Uh, so you've got to redraw them. Uh, that is going to be happening 
over the next few months, because we have just finished another census, as you know, so you're going to be reading a lot about this in the newspapers, um, the process of redrawing, I think Illinois just dropped their first proposed maps, it will be happening over the next few months. Um, so just to interrupt you for a, mo a moment, like, you might think that the gerrymandering topic in your book is about a map, the distance on a map, and to some extent it is, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a traditional, why is it even called gerrymandering? Because there's a guy, Elbridge Jerry, except I've now learned he's actually called Elbridge Gary, but that ship has sailed, everybody calls him Jerry, uh, who was governor of Massachusetts. He drew these very convoluted district lines in order to capture exactly the voters he wanted to be in certain districts to advantage his party, which people thought looked like a crazy salamander, thus the gerrymander. And so I think the stereotype has always been, man, we got to keep people from drawing these crazy districts that look like three octopuses polyamorously going at it or like whatever it may be. Um, you know, that should not be allowed. They should be like nice and plump, round, bread loaf like objects. And one thing we now know is that, you know, using modern computation you can make districts that look great and still are grievously, grievously gerrymandered in favor of one party. So we now have gerrymandering that's undetectable to the naked eye. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. It means that the mathematical tools we have to use to understand and eventually prove before a court just how unfair a given map is are inevitably going to be a little bit more subtle. So, I mean, I, I kind of feel like the punchline here, if, I, if you don't mind me at least alluding to it, is that you, you have displayed and through the work of you know, lots of folks, including our friend Moon Duchin, uh, uh, that in order to really understand what it means to be gerrymandered is get an, a new notion of distance, distance from a reasonable uh, districting. Can you s say a little bit about that? Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a move that it takes place lots of times in the book, actually. And this is another place that it takes place. You think it's one level of geometry. You think it's the geometry of the shape of the state, the state of Massachusetts or the state of Wisconsin, which I write about a lot because we have a particularly for Schlugener map in, Mass in, in here in Wisconsin. Um, but it turns out that that geometry is not so relevant. It's, the, it's a higher, more abstract geometry, the geometry of the space of all possible maps. Well, that is a huge space. If you're cutting up Wisconsin into 99 pieces, which is the thing that I write about uh, most in the book is kind of my central uh, example. The number of ways to do that is absolutely uncomputably infeasibly huge. So the question of how you explore that space, um, which inevitably involves right, this notion of distance, what does it mean for one map to be similar to or near another? Exactly the mathematical computation that people end up doing is saying, hey, you look at this map that these partisan operatives drew, not even legislators, by the way, who are supposed to do it. People who are just people whose job is working for a certain political party. We're not elected to anything. These are the people who act are actually drawing these maps. Um, you say, and look at all the maps that are near it. And you notice that if you nudge it just a little tiny bit in any direction, the gerrymandering falls away. I mean, these things are incredibly precisely engineered to give maximal advantage to one party. And they're like very visible outliers among their neighbors. They're like, you know, like the warthog in a litter of kittens. Thank you so much. I love that example. It's a wonderful example. And it's just a wonderful example of how you do that, that lifting, that sort of geometry that seems obvious, and then sort of the meta geometry. Um, and, and, and I'm going to bring us to another example where the actual first layer isn't at all apparent to it, to most people, which is um, this idea of the bias in language, the word to vec algorithm. Um, as some of you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a person who thinks a lot about algorithms. I have strong opinions. Um, so whenever Jordan starts writing about algorithms, I, I, I furrow my brows and, and worry. But I really think you nailed this absolutely correctly in your book. I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, the experiment that happened and, 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 and the outcomes. Yeah, and of course, I'll just tell you, you know, one thing that's so great about writing books, and I know you feel the same way, is that you can like really stretch out and like cover things the way they should be covered. And all the things that some of a, a, a careful, skeptical reader such as yourself would be like, well, oh, wait a minute, what about, you know, you get to do it, you get to do it all and like really sort of like talk about things properly, which is such a pleasure. Um, so word to back, okay, what is it? It is a machine that takes 
any word and identifies it with a point in 300 dimensional space. Okay, so what the hell is 300 dimensional space? One of the themes of the book is that, you know, all of our intuition, like the shaggy savannah dwellers, right, is from three dimensions or maybe even two. Two dimensions, what we can perceive, three dimensions, like what we move in. Um, one of the great innovations of geometry that takes place um, over this development as a formal subject is you're like, oh, you can do things in any number of dimensions you want. And even though we can't visualize that, the tools that we determine for thinking about things like vectors, things like motion, um, they still work. There's this great line that Jeffrey Hinton has, the sort of like neural nets guru, and somebody sort of stops him in the middle of a lecture. And it's like, how do you how, how do you visualize this 14 dimensional space that you're searching in the moment? And he's like, well, it's easy. You visualize three dimensional space. And then you very loudly say 14. <laughs> So that's exactly what I do. I think that's I what I We all do it. So that's so, okay, but I'm supposed to be talking about words. So a word is a point in three to hundred dimensional space, which maybe it's hard to imagine, but you can imagine that there's still some notion of, of closeness and farness. And there's still some notion of moving in a certain direction. So, okay. So wait, I'm going to interrupt you again. Like maybe the, you know, maybe, maybe the notion the sort of, first level notion of closeness with words should be words that are often seen together. You know, like, yes, I mean, there's lots of, but there's lots of notions you could use. And this is so important right. that the theme through the book that you choose what you mean by closeness mm -hmm. and there's no right or wrong answer. The, there's right. sort of the question of what answer is best for your purpose. So for right. one purpose, you might say closeness means they're near each other in alphabetical order in the dictionary. Okay. If you were trying I was just going to say in English, like you, you might say the most, you know, because you that is a phrase that you hear a lot. Although the is used with lots of words, so the right. would be close to a lot of things in that sense of closeness. But I'm just trying to give an idea of like what you you might start out with. Right, and it's definitely the notion of closeness that they use. Uh, Thomas Mikolov is the fellow at Google who I think is the lead author on this paper. Um, the notion of closeness they use exactly comes from this, you know, gigantic corpus of English text that they have access to that you and I do not, right? This kind of uh, huge amount of English text. And so roughly speaking, they say two words are close if they appear in the same kind of contexts. It's not so much if they appear near each other, it's, it's more like if they appear near the same cloud of other types of words if they're going to if you don't mind i would i would suggest this is like the crossword clue notion of closeness right so if you're if you have a one word crossword clue um you're looking for a word where you can come up with a sentence with that word or the the hint that basically mean the same thing so that that is the notion right you could replace one with the other in some context anyway and get the same meaning Yes, I love that. Right. So if there was ever two words that you would be undecided between while filling out a crossword, those would be words that would likely be very close uh, in this word to Vec metric. Um, and so um, a sort of very, very famous demo that they did that convinced people, hey, there's like you're really getting something out of this device is they studied what direction and how far you go in order to move he to the word she. Mm. So that's what we call in math a vector, uh, like a, a rule for sort of going from one part of space to another. And then they say, well, what happens if you apply to other words? Like the thing you do from get to get from he to she, what happens if you apply that motion to the word king? And what are they get? Yeah, well, they don't land exactly on another word, but the closest word to the point where they do land is queen. Okay, so they were very excited, right? Like they made an analogy machine. Well, think about this the way I think about like practically all really exciting demos in machine learning, which is on the one hand, it truly is kind of cool, with, but it's also not a magical machine, right? It's not what it's what the, what the machine is capturing. It's is not exactly meaning, um, but just a record of how this word is used, and the meaning of the word is part of that but it's not the only part. So now, um... and I'm going to interrupt you once again, because this is kind of my favorite topic, um, which is that we constantly hear or not constantly, but I, I constantly hear examples while um, you say that. claims um, from, from people who do machine learning that they're somehow understanding truth in some abstract concept of truth 
some kind of platonic knowledge of understanding of truth. But what they're actually understanding is how humans use things, how human, like the, it's a reflection more of the human brain or human habits even um, than it is about any concept of truth. Exactly. Right. So it's not, so it's, you know, if you do it to actor, you do indeed get actress. If you do it to waiter, you do indeed get waitress. But if you do it to the word stunning, you get gorgeous. Okay, that is not actually like the female version of stunning. All it is is a word that people typically use in when they're talking about a woman that they don't when talking about a man. So it's kind of not, it's not keeping track in any sense of the meaning of the word. It's keeping track of like, yes, our habits. I'm looking at some other ones. Oh, right. So it turns swagger into sassiness and it turns obnoxious into bitchy. Uh, brilliant into fabulous. I mean, it just goes on and on. And, you, and you're like, wait, those are not like the female versions of those words. Those are just, oh, a female genius is a minx. That's one of the- <laughs> Okay, but, and, and yet there are problematic examples of this as well. Wait, you didn't already think that was problematic? <laughs> well- <laughs> I thought I, I was being called problematic a examples. <laughs> one of the things I like about this, this shift, I'll call it a shift that it's not exactly, it, it depends on a notion of, 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 of distance. Sorry for my puppy in the background, That's but cool. it also it sort of, you know, it actually uh, it makes use of this concept of the shift that by the vector, that distance, that sort of, that shift from the male to the female version is that you can de-shift things. Once you have this notion of a shift to the right, you can shift to the left. Yeah, and uh, so like, Male Karen is a Steve. That was what my son asked me, like, what's a male Karen? If you sort of take, start with the word, with the name Karen and go. Uh... Right. So the thing, but the thing of it is, I think what's, and I really want to encourage this. One thing I want to compliment Google is that they make this tool and they give these demos where they're like, look at this like incredible thing that it's like this magical analogy machine, but they do make it a for people to use so you can play with it on your own and you quickly see that it's not magical and you quickly see that there's many more situations in which it returns trash than situation it would, in which it returns something uh, something useful. And I commend them for that, right? I mean, it's good that they make that available for us to do. Yeah. I have two more questions and then I know that there's plenty of people very eager to ask you questions. So I'll get out of the way after these last two questions. The first one, I wanna just bring up COVID modeling. Um, the geometry of COVID modeling, um, I personally feel like there was a lot of really terrible modeling that happened early on in the pandemic that where people once again sort of assumed that models were magical. And so I, I kind I'm of want you to address that our host Kate is now attending, by the way, if we're going to name names. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're all over the place though. You can't really even name the worst model, I don't think. But um, I want you to sort of riff on our notion of this magic ability of mathematics to sort of give us truth that doesn't even exist. And then what, what, who, who got something right? Yeah. And I'll say this, like I did it too. I mean, this is something that Kathy and I talked about a lot over the course of the last year. I mean, you almost can't help trying to, if you, if the skills that you have are mathematical skills and you're in this kind of like crisis with a huge amount of unknowns, like, I mean, as we were, uh, around this time last year. There's, I mean, it's still a crisis, but there's fewer unknowns now than there were then. Uh, it's only human to try to use the skills you have to bring to bear on it, to be like, what can I offer in this situation of extremity? So probably a lot of us were like drawing curves and trying to figure out what was going on and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, the, the metaphor I finally came down to in the book, and it was a funny thing to be writing about, you know, while it was happening and, you know, having to finalize this last October. Um, and actually, I feel pretty good, honestly, about the way the book looks, even though it was sort of set in stone last October. Um, I finally ended up with the, the following metaphor. I mean, people want modeling to be like physics. People want to be able to say, here is what we have seen so far. Now, like, tell me the future of the system. And in fact, you know, Ronald Ross, this kind of crazy character who I write about in the book, um, who together with Hilda Hudson, the algebraic geometer, developed really the sort of first embryonic versions of the models that everybody now uses, this so-called SIR model. He very explicitly was like, I'm gonna develop 
like a physics of everything, like a physics of like every single thing that happens in human society and the way things change. I'm just going to reduce it to differential equations. Okay, that doesn't really work. Um, on the other hand, I think going all the way the other way and saying that's just like a sort of stupid doomed project that you shouldn't do, I think is also wrong. And the metaphor that I ended up with that I feel pretty satisfied by is that it's kind of like tennis. Like if you sort of say like, can I use physics to figure out what happens if you throw a tennis ball up in the air? You can, you can actually do really well. Um, if you say, can I use physics to figure out what happens if you hit the tennis ball? Yeah, kind of, it's harder. But I mean, if you know with what force you're hitting it and what kind of spin, it's a harder physics problem, but you can certainly say something pretty meaningful about what the ball is gonna do. Um, can you use physics to say what the outcome of a tennis match is gonna be? No, that's not physics because that's physics, but also human response to the physics in this kind of iterative way that is not gonna be well modeled by anything simple. On the other hand, it's definitely true that if you are playing tennis, whether implicitly or explicitly, you're using those physics models to figure out what to do, at least in the short term. So that, that in the end is sort of where I came down. These kind of curve fitting models that um, IHME was doing out of, out of University of Washington and like many other people, the sort of the, the infamous cubic fit. I, I wrote about that. That's a, actually, there's a piece of the book that's in Slate today if you wanna look at it and sort of see what I have to say about the, the famous cubic fit. Um, all of these things, have a history and all of these things are good for something, but what they're not good for is like predicting, actually predicting the future in some oracular way at any kind of range. And I think people were so desperate to know the future that I think that um, people saw them that way and I can't blame them. I mean, I probably did it too. We all were scared and wanted to know the future. Um, I had to leave just for a second because my dog was tearing apart my toilet paper, um, which he does when he doesn't get enough attention. Um, my final question, Jordan, um, is a question that is for both of us. So I'm going to start, if you don't mind, which is um, as mathematicians. Ask the question is that what you're doing? Okay. <laughs> um, well, you told me to ask this question. So, um, yeah. you know, as mathematicians, like, in fact, we have similar backgrounds. We even have the same thesis advisor. Um, we're both now talking to the public about mathematical ideas, or at least what we claim to be mathematical ideas. And just as I asked you, like, how do you think you can get away with calling all of this stuff geometry? I would like to ask, how do we think we can get away with calling all of this stuff mathematical thinking? Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just start by saying that, like, one of the things that I value so much about my mathematical training, which I do think I use on a sort of you know, daily basis in my current life as an algorithmic auditor and author is this notion that like there are no dumb questions, question um, that we should question um, assumptions at all times. Like what if you tweak an assumption just a little bit, the entire universe of conclusions after that changes. Um, and I think most importantly, um, probably as a cultural um, principle that I have I gathered from 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 our our education in particular advisor is this notion that like it's really a pleasure to be told you're wrong. You know, it's a it's actually like when someone tells you you're wrong, you're like, thank you. Because <laughs> you just saved me months of going down the wrong the wrong path. Um, so this kind of like curiosity, this openness um, this and you know that doesn't sound a lot like mathematics to most people, but I'm going to argue that it is in fact mathematical training. And now it's your turn. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I want to sort of strongly endorse that in that I think, and this actually comes up in in my last book, How Not to Be Wrong, too, as you might guess from the title, that people think of math as the science of certainty, right? That we're going to sort of just like what people sometimes want from us is like, okay, so tell us how it is in this incontrovertible way. And no, in some sense, I think knowing math makes you more uncertain because you know the difference between <laughs> reasoning that leads to certainty and the much sloppier, more heuristic reasoning that you have no choice but to rely on. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying that's what we've got available uh, for a lot of your world problems. I mean, some, something I say about gerrymandering in the book, and I think this is true of a lot interesting questions, certainly pandemics, certainly questions about how do machines deal with language that we've talked about tonight. Um, I say in the book, it's, it's not a math problem. 
right? It's not just a matter of drawing a nice grid across the state and calling it a day, right? It's not a math problem, but it's not not a math problem. <laughs> The math is in there and it's one of the facets and it's wound up with the law and the politics in ways that can't really be unwound. And I think those are the most interesting problems for people like us to try to get purchase on. Um, I don't, I would never say that the mathematical way of thinking is superior to other ways, right? I will admit that math is kind of an imperialistic tendency where people are inclined to say that, but I think that's to be resisted. On the other hand, I think it is like a very particular mindset and a very particular training. And it's one facet, which if it is lost, and actually I think that's, you know, most of the history of legal and political writing about gerrymandering doesn't really engage with the quantitative side. And I think that's why it hasn't succeeded because you actually are missing something. Um, so I think what's most exciting is when there's these partnerships between people with our training and people with other kinds of training, um, really trying to the extent possible to see and talk about these problems um, from all sides. Thank you so much, Jordan. And those that's the end of my questions. And now from, from now on, I'm just going to be stealing other people's questions. So yeah, I would I like to uh, encourage everyone who's on, um, on the Zoom call with us to submit your questions to Q&A. Um, we only have a few, so you know you've got a great opportunity right now. Um, I think this is a great one. What if anything beyond the metric itself makes it useful to think of these problems as metric spaces? So that's a great question, and I will say that some of the and I actually opened it so that I can like see the whole words of the questions. Thanks, Hi Hao. Um, First of all, the book does have some stuff for those who know the distinction about topological spaces. Um, although even there, I would say there's some notion of, in a topological space, you still have the notion of what it means for two things to get closer and closer and approach each other, even if you don't have a numerical notion of distance. So sort of speaking to a first approximation, I consider those the same. Um, but I would say, to be honest, um, the book is not about using deep theorems about geometry. Like at no point am I gonna invoke the Poincaré conjecture or compute a fundamental group or uh, or like really like use the properties of a Riemannian metric in a way that one might if one were like really doing um, differential geometry. In fact, I'll say, you know, this semester I was teaching undergraduate real analysis, a course that I've never taught before. And one of the groups of people who take it is people who are studying economics, especially people who are getting graduate degrees in economics. And so I was very interested, like why do um, economists need to learn like this style of math. And I will be honest with you, and I wonder if there's any economists in the room who want to speak to this. I left kind of unconvinced that economists actually need to know like fixed point theorems and theorems about compact spaces. Like I don't, you're nodding, Kathy, so maybe you know this more than me. What I read while I was prepping to teach this class did not convince me that it's these deep theorems of math, wonderful as they are, are, are truly so important for economics. But um, well, I would say that there's there's quite a few concepts in economics that that rely on the idea of a fixed point and uh, you know local and and global sort of. I'm not. I'm, I'm even repenting of that. Of even as I said it, because the game theory stuff. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. The stuff I'm writing about in these books typically don't depend on like the kind of deep theorems that you would learn uh, when you get a PhD in math. I think it's more that they depend on a style of looking at things. I mean, Poincaré is ever present in the book, but not really through his theorems, like through his approach. And he's so quotable too. I mean, you can't not quote this guy. <laughs> I'm tempted to just ask you for some good quotes um, from Poincaré and others. Just mathematics is the art of calling different things by the same name. Classic, man, classic. <laughs> I wish you said that. Now someone asks, um, uh, Murphy Kate Monty asks, um, Hi, Murphy. Um, if you, so we were talking about shifting to the right from a Karen to a Steve. And the question is, what if you shift to the right again? What's the more male version of Steve? And I think that's, I, I, I don't know the answer and I don't expect you to, but I do think that's a cool concept of iterating on that shift. Yeah, and I can tell you what I would guess just from my memory of like messing around. I wrote a long blog post called Messing Around with Word 2 Vec where you can see like all kinds of like crazy experiments like this. If you just search for it on my blog, Kwame you'll see it. Maybe if Kate wants to like Google that while we're talking, she can post it in the in the chat window, a link to it. Um, but the the um the things that are first names in English, 
as you might expect, are all kind of in one sort of closely knit region of these three hundred dimensional space because they're exactly the kind of things that could substitute for each other in a sentence, like in a sentence that's like, hi, my name is blank, right? What's going to go there is going to be an English first name. So my guess would be that it would probably be the closest point to the sort of Steve plus he minus she would be some other male first name, but I don't know which one. And it would be a perfect example of the fact that like in most cases, this operation doesn't really do anything that you would think of as like being meaning or making an analogy. It, it's not, I don't even know like what, if you just asked people based on your gender stereotypes, what would be like a more <laughs> masculine Steve? I don't Someone know. Someone suggested Biff. Biff, yeah. Um. Um, okay, so somebody's asking, um, and I'm not doing this in any particular order. Um, how can we, we how can we relate inequality and distance? Distance in the sense of ex access to technology, like basic phone service, wireless internet service, or other things. I mean, I would say that in some sense, like, and this is something that Kathy knows more about than me, but I think kind of too blindly, like using these notions of distance, doing this thing that Poincaré said to do, which in many cases is very useful of saying, hey, we're going to identify things that are close enough, things that are close enough to each other, we're going to say are the same, um, that can reify inequalities. Like this is like what happens, I mean, Kathy, just tell me if I'm sort of saying stuff that's not correct. But I think like if somebody says, hey, we're going to deny you a loan because we think in the ways that we've decided matter, you are close to like other people who didn't pay back their loan before. So we're going to call you by the same name and that name is going to be, you don't get a loan. Um, so I, I do think, um, you know, what is socially downstream of these things is like really, really important. Um, and that's, that can be an effect of doing math without thinking too hard about what you're doing. Yeah, I guess I would probably frame it a little bit as um, like the distance to um, the part of the world that is highly datafied, for example. Like there's there's a lot of evidence that people who just aren't very datafied, that don't have that much data about them, um, are much more likely to be denied a loan, for example. So there's like, you could probably create a metric that it's like, how close are you to the type of data fication um, that will give you more advantages. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have well, a next I question. A question. Oh, uh, yeah. I hear people's questions rather than sort of riffing on. Everything yeah. What you want to know. Um, here's a great question. What is you know what is the relationship? This is David Condon. What's the relationship between distance and and change over time in a system? And he's giving you a, a hint that he thinks it might be calculus. Yeah, so, um, you know, first of all, one thing, there's so much, there's so many places in the book where there's sort of a step I take into an area and then I'm like, okay, I don't have room or time to explore this would be great to talk about, but no. So, so one of those things is, you know, this idea of phase space, the idea that, you know, you can think of as Poincaré did, think about sort of like celestial bodies moving around in space. And one way to conceptualize it is, okay, they have coordinates like where they are and those coordinates change. And another way of thinking of it is that, the location and the velocity are each coordinates on their own. And so it's a point in some kind of space whose coordinates themselves keep track of the motion. Um, and this, you know, for those of us who are topologists and think about, you know, the space of paths in a smaller space, that's this kind of, again, this move from going from a lower order geometry to a higher order, more abstract geometry. Um, I will say this, so there's not actually that much calculus in this book. Um, Steve Strogatz has a wonderful book uh, called Infinite Powers, which like really kind of delves into like the history of calculus and sort of how it's, uh, so it's, you know, it's like the moving version of my book. If you hold my book and like wave it back and forth, that's like Steve's book. But that's a great book about which, which, which touches on that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just, choosing randomly here. I'm going to read this one about the process of evolution by um, Anonymous. The process of evolution by natural selection has been very successful by of exploring huge space and finding organisms that can survive and reproduce. Do we know why and are there better algorithms? Yeah, so, and you know, one of the things, yet another thing that I would have loved to write about in this book and didn't do, we talked about stuff that is in the book, but you know, I write a lot about trees um, which is our, a fundamental kind of geometric structure. They turn out to be critical to the guts of how these gerrymandering detection programs work. 
Um, it's a perfect example of a geometry that we use instinctively all the time. We talk about close relatives or distance relatives. So we are invoking this idea of a metric that on the family tree. Um, but of course, this is also a metaphor in the study of evolution, right? Sort of like Darwin draws these trees, like famously, famously in his notebooks, uh, which I didn't end up talking about in the book. Um, but ah. let me say this. The, the exploration process I write about in the book, and I write about it actually a lot in a lot of different contexts, is actually not evolution by natural selection. It's the random walk, which is much, much dumber than evolution, right? It's like, it's like evolution without selection. It's just like walk around randomly and see where you go. And the amazing thing is that that turns out already to be an incredibly powerful exploration paradigm. So, and I learned, I actually had no idea how interesting the history of this concept was. Somehow between 1900 and 1905, just people all over the world are kind of independently coming up with the basic idea of random walks. Somehow the world was exactly ready in this moment um, for it, you know, in finance and in, in biology, in the propagation of disease. Um, and then of course, Markov of the Markov chain, because he's like this kind of angry atheist who's trying to win an argument with like a sort of arch conservative, like Russian Orthodox mathematician who is like his sworn enemy. And somehow he invents the Markov chain in order to win this theological argument. And he totally like crushes his rival with it. So that's, that's actually um, e even more primitive than evolution somehow. And yet it's like, it turns out to be very deep. So there's a lot about that in the book. Kathy, I can't hear you all. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. I noticed that there's a link in your in the Q and A uh, to your blog, and and if you want to say a couple words about what you how you use your blog and how people who enjoy the book might might use it as a resource. I, yeah, I mean, I love blogging. I know people say blogging is dead, um, and you know, I tweet too. So do you, Kathy? But Twitter is not very good for math. It's not really like a good way to talk about mathematics. I think blogging is still the best for that you have a little more room to stretch out i actually kathy was just on your blog looking at something yesterday and i was like i wish kathy still blogged more kathy's blog is really good um i've been doing it for a long time and i actually have really incredibly valued this mode of like talking about math informally, but in public, which really is completely new. I think there was nothing like it before blogging started. And I found it to be very intellectually enriching. And my blog is about like lots of weird stuff. Did we lose Kathy? I was wondering, I, I didn't know if you guys lost me or if uh, we lost Kathy. Okay, no, I think, I, we, I think we may have lost Kathy. <laughs> no, I think she's coming back. Okay. Okay. I, I didn't know. I Did you guys hear all the stuff I said about my blog? Because I was like unsure whether I was talking into the void. Yes. Great. Okay. Kathy, can you try saying something? I don't know. Can Kathy hear us? I don't know. We can see you. Kathy, give us a thumbs up if you can hear us right now. Hmm. Should I look at some of the questions? I can look at some of the questions and sort of see um, what I can I think that's say. a great idea. Yeah, she'll be back soon. Okay, um, so let me answer. Uh, let me answer um, Gary Goldstein's question about uh, U.S. politics today is plagued by distances that seem to be unsurmountable. How can geometry those distances closer? So you know, the book is not that political, except for this part about districting. That is, political, and it's about this kind of problem that intertwines math and politics. Um, you know, I'm going to give because that's my way. Um, I think this process 
gerrymandering is understood by everyone to be unfair and undemocratic, even by the Supreme Court in their decision saying we're not going to stop it. They said they didn't say this is fine. They said this is incompatible with democracy, but it's not our place to do anything about it. So everyone agrees on this. Um, when people in the public hear about it, they when they learn about it, they don't like it and they routinely vote in large numbers for ballot referenda, putting a stop to it. In, con in states where they're allowed to do so. Um, what I think the method, the geometry can do by identifying the absolute worst offenders and hopefully allowing us to kind of put some guardrails and prevent political parties from absolutely gerrymandering the hell out of a state, we can't take gerrymandering to zero, but we don't need to. If we can guardrail it and get rid of the absolute most grievous gerrymanders, it reduces the incentive to gerrymander and it creates political space for parties to find compromises with each other, which in the end, I think is what people want. People want there to be a political process. Nobody wants a political process to be replaced by an automated process. Um, and right now I think we're in a situation where the rewards to a political party for gerrymandering without any constraints or limits whatsoever it's just too great for the parties to turn down. They just can't bring themselves to not do it. Um, we can make it easier for them to not do it by limiting the extent to which they can. Okay. So now I'm not seeing Kate or Kathy, but I'm just gonna keep on flipping through these questions. And oh, there's Kate, okay. Oh, I'm still here. I just was, I thought you'd go through some of the questions. Yeah, I'll still do it, okay. Sounds um, great, I'm here. Just, just signal me like, um... so Tanya B asks the question, is there really a different way of thinking? So she observes that there's lots of stuff we kind of cognitively do. There is sensing, there is intuiting, there is observation, there is instinct. But when it comes to reasoning, is there really any other way? So what I would say, this is again, something the immensely quotable Poincaré had a lot to say about. He actually identified, he said, what, what kind of mathematicians are geometers? Like what separates a geometer from other mathematicians? He thought that the geometers were the people who relied more on intuition, who had more intuition as opposed to kind of formal algebraic stuff um, in their work. So what I would say is that, um, and certainly what Poincaré said, so I'm sort of channeling him, is that it is never just a matter of thinking rationally and formally deducing, never just a matter of intuition. Those are the two pillars that support your thinking. And those things are not really separable. He has a wonderful metaphor of the skeleton of a sponge. And the skeleton is like formal geometry, like we learn in school, like this kind of very rigid structure of this follows logically from that, follows logically from that, follows logically from that. He would say, hey, if you don't have that rigid structure, the thing falls apart, right? If you just kind of think about things intuitively and never bother to formalize and really try to write down a proof, you're just gonna be very floppy and the thinking is not gonna be good. On the other hand, if you just see the skeleton, of the sponge that used to be there and say, oh, that's the thing, that's what we're supposed to be studying. And you don't know or don't recognize or refuse to admit that it was produced by a living thing uh, in order to support it. In other words, if you sort of just try to study the formalities without recognizing the existence of the intuitive faculties that drive our geometric thinking, that is also not gonna work. Then you're gonna be doing something that's sterile and ultimately brittle. So I really try as hard as I can, like not to separate sensing and reasoning and intuiting. I think you gotta be doing all of those at the same time to do anything you might call mathematical. Okay, let's see. Um, what else? Um, I'll answer some of the short questions. Um, can geometry also explain the electoral college? I talk about the electoral college a bit in the book, um, partly just because I think in order to think about this problem of gerrymandering, you have to kind of step back a little bit and be like, and say, what does it even mean to be represented? If you can't decide on that, it's very hard to talk about what you mean when you say a gerrymandered map is fair or not. So the Electoral College is certainly an example of a system which many people would see as unfair. And I think one thing you learn by going back and studying the history is that you know a lot of times we're like, well, the founders decided. They were pretty wise people. They created a system that lasted a long time. They must have known what they were doing. The Electoral College is certainly not like that. The Electoral College is not a sort of 
solution arrived at in wisdom. It was a thing about which the framers of the constitution absolutely could not agree. And they worked on it and worked on it and got really mad at each other and couldn't do it. And they basically like all went home in the constitutional convention and they left 11 people, the so-called committee on unfinished parts to be like all of the things we can't agree on, the sort of nastiest problems, you guys got to do something. And they basically worked on it uh, until they got tired. And then they finally, so if you've been to like a meeting at your work, where you know it's like 5:30 and it's like almost time to like pick up from daycare and everybody's got to leave and you're like we got to just all sign something and at this point we're all exhausted it doesn't matter what it is just find something anything we can all sign that's what college is just to, to be honest take it as something that reflects uh the wisdom of the founders of this country who were wise in many ways just maybe not that way um somebody asks what makes a mathematical result great or interesting? And related, how do you choose the examples in your book? Um, what makes a mathematical result great or interesting is like a super interesting and super hard question, right? It's a question about taste and it's a question about sociology. I mean, there's no objective answer to that question. Mathematicians are a society. Math is made of people. Um, and somehow what we decide is important is pretty similar to the way that artists decide what work of art is important or that writers decide what books are important. Um, but if you want to, the question that I can answer, how I chose the examples in the book, um, it's pretty easy. I have a, you know, when I'm, when I'm proposing a book, I write this proposal and I have this nice outline that's very organized and all these things I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then I start writing and then it's like this kind of like random branching process where I'm writing about something and I'm researching it and I find something else that it's connected to. And then I'm like, oh my God, that has to be in the book. Uh, like I've got to follow that chain and see what I do. Um, and so in the end, then there's just lots of stuff in the book. And often I don't write about a lot of the stuff I originally planned to write about. And I do write about tons of stuff that I didn't know I was going to write about. And, you know, hopefully some trace of that shows in the book. I'm never writing about something unless I'm really excited about it. It's much more interesting to me to write about stuff that I'm learning and just finding out about than stuff that I already know. Um, but I think because everything is adjacent to something else, everything you write about, you're writing about because something else in the book reminded you, you of it, it does all hold together. Maybe I'll show this picture. So just to kind of keep my mind straight, I ended up having to draw like a big map of what was in the book and I will show it to you. Um, I don't know if you can read, probably not, what's on this, but uh, it's just like a bunch of different concepts and people who are in the book. And I sort of like drew little lines. This is what in math we would call a graph. And I talk about the crazy story of Lester in the book and how it got that name. Um, hey, Jordan, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'm sh sharing, can you see this? Oh, you've got it. I've got it up, yeah. Awesome, that's much better. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this, is, this isn't this is even like, this is maybe like a third of the different things that are in the book, but this is kind of what my brain looked like while I was writing it. Um, and, um, and this is the structure you end up with when you sort of like follow the chains of thought and analogy, like wherever they go while you're writing. So as you can imagine, it was hard to figure out what order to put things in, but I think I found an order that like really makes sense and has a project and has a progression. Um, oh, I want to say something about the two cultures. Lawrence Lubin asks, uh, how does C.P. Snow's two cultures relate to the thesis of the book? So this is a famous essay by C.P. Snow positing that there's like two really separate cultures, a kind of humanistic culture and a scientific culture that have two fundamentally different outlooks and are in some sense always in tension with each other. Um, I would say no, like totally no. I'm like an anti-Snowist in this way. And I think one of the surprises to me writing this book was, for example, how much poetry is in it. Partly because like so many of the geometrists I wrote about were incredibly interested in poetry. Sylvester kind of writes an entire book called The Laws of Verse, like sort of trying to like develop a mathematical basis for poetry. William Rowan Hamilton, as I mentioned, uh, is like a would-be poet. And also poets who are interested in math. Um, I mentioned Wordsworth, who's at the very beginning of the book, at the very end of the book is Rita Dove, who has this wonderful poem called Geometry about, you know, and sometimes something that I wanted to say about geometry 
and I couldn't articulate. And then I find out, oh, there's actually like a poem called Geometry by the Poet Laureate of the United States that exactly expresses this idea like much better than I could have. So I think the more you study the actual inner lives of who are ostensibly these called the more you find that there are not two cultures, that the mental processes are very similar. Poets um, have a lot to appreciate in mathematics, have a lot to appreciate from poets. Well, Jordan, we are coming up on the end of our hour here, um, a little bit over time. I feel so okay. bad that Kathy couldn't come back to join us. I wonder what, how, how much toilet paper has her dog eaten by now? Do you think? That's what <laughs> I think happened. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> it's going to come back and there's just going to be like this confetti like scene of like toilet paper flying everywhere and the dog jumping I around. wish we were all there to see that. We miss you, Kathy, wherever we you are, you, if you're somehow watching this. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you if you want to end here or take one last question and then I can have some closing remarks. Um No, I think I think we're I think we're good. I think I, I know we're over time. Um so let's so we can we can close it up. Yeah. Well, thank you tremendously um, to both Jordan and Kathy, who we miss dearly, for this completely fascinating conversation that seems to cover every topic under the sun. And there's so much more content in the book itself. Uh, thank you, everyone, also for joining us this evening and being patient with any minor technical difficulties. If you would like to learn more, um, I have spammed you with links in the chat. Copies of Shape are for sale on harvard.com via the links that I provided. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, have a good evening, keep reading, and please, please be well. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thanks everybody for coming.